Go ahead. Yeah. Um, we can get, kind of get a sense of it. Um, let's start by trying to figure out where these two things meet. So 2x squared minus x cubed equals 0. Back right x squared, I get 2 minus x. <clears throat> So I think my bounds are zero and two, right? So, I mean, I'll draw somewhat of a curve, but um, yeah, I'm not really sure what this cubic is gonna look like, but what I do know is where it crosses the x-axis. So at the origin and x equals two. Um, is it gonna be above or below the x-axis in between that interval? Should be above, right? So I think that's the area that I'm looking at. Why am I saying that it's above the x-axis in between those two points? If you plug in x equals one, y equals one. Right, if you plug in x equals one, you get a positive number. So that's one of the, the subtle things about when you find these intersects. We found that the x-axis and this curve intersect at two places, but we've also shown that it can't, that can't happen anywhere else. So in between those two points, you either have to have a curve that's positive or negative everywhere. So there's the region. I would now like to find the volume by revolving it around the y-axis. So how do I set that up? Can I use the disk method? So I didn't specify which way I wanted to do this. Is the disk method something I can do? I see some doubtful looks. Why are you in doubt? Like, I, so if I were to set up the disk method, what would I have to do? You'd want to get it in, in, in the Y. I it's, can't remember. Yeah, you have to get so I would have to have a function of X in terms of Y, right? Um I think isolating X in this um is either gonna be more trouble than it's worth or just not possible. So yeah, I think the, the because of that, the shell method is probably going to be the more effective way to go. So when I use the shell method, I can basically use x as my independent variable. So I have these vertical slices. I'm going to wrap these around the y-axis to make a thin cylindrical shell. All right, so that's kind of the setup here. How can I continue? Okay, so got to find the radius and the height. That's how this this method this is what this method depends on. So volume equals two pi <clears throat> times the radius times the height or the integral of this. So for any slice I make there. How can I define the radius? Should just simply be x, right? So since I'm revolving around x equals zero, then my radius is just going to come from the x values. So that's the radius. What is the height? Uh, right, so basically the x value gives the radius, the y value on this curve gives the height. So, I think I have my two functions. I'm getting closer. Now what? Change what terms? Right. So yeah, we're going to integrate in terms of x. So yeah, we don't have to do any solving, which is good because for this cubic, I don't even know if that's possible. But I think we're we're getting close to setting up this integral. What are my bounds? Zero. zero and two. So the integral from zero to two of radius times height.
So I think that's that's a good setup for the integral. Any questions on where that integral came from before we calculate it? All right. Now what? Do some simplifying. So if I expand this stuff out, I get 2x cubed minus x to the fourth dx. And if I integrate, if I find the antiderivative of that, what do I get? One half x to the fourth minus one fifth x to the fifth. If I plug in two, I get half of 16 minus 32 over five. And then, yeah, minus zero. <clears throat> Any questions there? All right, moving on. All right. You go ahead and tell me how, how would you like to start this one? Find the bounds? How do you find the bounds? So x squared equals 2x. Which gives me that so again my bounds are going to be x, uh, 0 and 2. So I got the bounds in the x direction. Are we sure we want to set up this integral of using x as the variable? So I mean, I'm not, I'm not mandating the shell method here. So if the disk method is better, we can we can try that. So if it's revolving around the x-axis, well, it depends on which method you're using. So what does this thing look like? There's the area, revolving it around the x-axis. <clears throat> so do we have to revolve, do we have to set up this integral in terms of x or y yet? I don't think that's, I don't think, that, I don't think we're committed to one way or the other yet. But if I want to revolve this thing around the x-axis, what are you thinking? We just use the disk method. Okay, if we use the disk method, how's that going to work? So the volume is equal to the integral. So pi times the integral from A to B, so zero to two, of whatever my outer radius is squared minus my inner radius squared. Is that all we have to do? So I think in this case, the disk method is going to be more effective, more efficient. Because um, think about it this way. If we wanted to, if we wanted to use the shell method, what would we have to do? Make it in terms of y. Which in this case, that's not terribly difficult. Um, but I think this integral is going to come out probably a little more simple than that one would. What is the outer radius? Two x should be two x. It's the yeah further upward, and the inner radius squared.
All right, any questions on where we are right now? All right, integral of 4x squared is what? What was that again? Oh, I didn't hear the over. Okay, 4 over 3x cubed minus. Uh, evaluate this again the zeros are going to fall off the uh, four thirds times h so 32 thirds minus 32 fifths so that's five 160 over 15 minus 96 over 15 The 64 pi over 15. All right. So this one, we, we kind of went against the, the new thing we've been learning. So we went against the shell method. I think one of the things I want to point out is that, and I don't know if we talked about this last time, but the disk method or the shell method, neither one of those is inherently better or inherently more useful. It all depends on the situation that you're looking at. So let's revisit this. Why is this one a better candidate for the disk method? Or why did, or why did we choose that? Just some of the work it's just simpler. Right, cuts out what, like, what did we not have to do because we did the disk method? Make it in terms of why. Right, so you have to re-express in terms of why. Um, but I think, this probably wouldn't have been all that much more complicated if we did the shell method. Go ahead. So that's, uh, let me erase this area in here. If we're going to do shells, so we're going around the x-axis, right? Uh, let me draw what we just did. And I think the hopefully the compare and contrast will be useful. So if I'm using X as my variable, that means that all my slices I'm going to make inside that area are going to be vertical, right? If I revolve those things around the X axis, then what does that make? That's that's a, like a, a, a cylindrical washer, right? <clears throat> so the big thing to pay attention to here is the, the reason we're, the reason the way we did it lent itself to the disk method is we're using X as our variable, right? That means as we let X grow or let X change, it makes these cylindrical washers with a very small thickness. We call this thickness DX. So as we let X change with that little infinitesimal distance we call DX, Basically, if you think about this as a cylinder, where are you adding volume onto the cylinder? Are you adding it to the base or are you adding it to the side? So a cylinder has two, two kinds of faces, right? So are we adding um, are we adding that volume? So as X grows a little bit, are we adding volume to the circular base or that rectangular sidewall? In this case, it's not the sidewall. Um, so as dx grows, basically, if dx changes, that means that you know we're going to the right, essentially. As we go to the right, then we're basically we're we're adding the thickness to the bottom of the cylinder, which is maybe a little obscured because the cylinder is like sitting kind of up on its wall. So because we're adding area or volume to that base, so that is why the disk method is built on areas of circles. So pi r squared minus pi little r squared. <coughs> and the volume of all those cylinders comes when you multiply those circular areas by dx, which is the, the height, the thickness. So that's the disk method, which is not what we did, or it is what we did. But if we did the shell method, so the one thing that we don't, we can't negotiate is we have to revolve this around the x-axis. 
if we want to make shells, the only way that's going to happen is if I take horizontal slices and wrap them around the axis. And if I do that, that's going to make these these cylindrical, these very thin cylindrical shells. So now, this integral is in terms of y. This right here is my dy. So as y changes, where am I adding area or where am I adding volume to my cylinder? On the base or on the sidewall? On the side, which is why the shell method is based on that area. The circumference 2 pi r times the height. So that rectangular area. So that's basically where where those formulas come from. They're basically they're based on either the area of a circle or the area of a rectangle. Any more questions about why this was this method and what shell method would have been? Well, how it would have been different. All right. Yeah. I think this is the same area that we looked at a while ago. <clears throat> but what are the differences going to be in how I handle this? Use the have to use the washer method. How come? It's, it's not what? It's not we're rolling on the x axis. We're rolling of x equals two. Right. So what kind of line is x equals two? It's vertical, right? So I think we said this thing crosses the x axis at oh no, this is a different area, isn't it? So at x equals zero and x equals one. This will cross. I want to revolve this around the line x equals 2, right? Which is a vertical line. So based on what we have, what's a better what's a better tool to use? The disk method or the shell method? Shell, how come? Um the if we right. Yeah, but involve completing the square, which I mean, we could do it, but why do it if you don't have to? So I believe shell method, yes, is the right way to go. So if we use shell method, what variable are we going to set up this integral in? X or Y? So if I set up this vertical slice here and I wrap this around. So there's my thin cylindrical shell. So how do I find the volume of a solid using the shell method? Two pi times the integral over the bounds. Do we know the bounds? Zero one, so we're using X. Okay, times the radius is a function of x times the height is a function of x. Can I define this radius of this solid in general? What's it going to be? So let's just think about the definition of what radius means for a cylinder. Go ahead. Is it two minus x? How'd you get that? Um, the distance from the center of this, this circle that we're right. making to the okay. Right, so that's essentially how to find the radius. The radius is basically how far am I rotating these rectangles, or sorry, how far away are these rectangles from the center of rotation, which is x equals 2. So if I'm going to characterize this distance, this right here is at x equals 2, and this right here is at generic x, right? Because I want I want to have some control over that. So the variable x is going to land somewhere between 0 and 1. So as I agree that the radius is going to be 2 minus x. <clears throat> How about the height? How tall are each one of those slices? Should just be equivalent to whatever the y value is, right? So yeah, I did I I didn't all I didn't like offset the y the, the vertical 
measurements at all. So the height is going to be equivalent to my y values, so x minus x squared dx. So any questions about that setup? This is one of the rare times when we've our axis rotation has been something other than a coordinate axis. Where are we good to keep calculating? All right, now what? Simplify. So if I expand, I get 2x minus x squared <clears throat> minus 2x squared minus x cubed. Plus x cubed. Plus x cubed. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. What else did I miss? Okay. All right. So the antiderivative of this thing is x squared minus x cubed plus one quarter x to the fourth. From one to zero, so two uh, two pi times one minus one plus a fourth minus zero, so it should be pi over two, right? All right, how we doing? All right. So now I'm mandating the shell method. I want to find the volume <clears throat> of this solid. So take a minute to read it through and then let's talk about how to attack it. What should we do first? Any impulse on what uh, method to use? Shell. Shell. Oh, never mind. I already mandated this. Okay, so we got to use the shell method. So how do we set that up? Two pi times the integral of a to b. Radius of what? Uh, what variable? Of x, right? <clears throat> upper bound. Is the x equals four our upper bound? Yeah, should be, right? Um, X equals four should be our upper bound. Do we have any idea what the lower one is? Should be zero, right? Um, square root of X is going to equal zero when X equals zero. Okay, so I have that. Do we know what our radius is gonna be? Should be X, right? Is it bothering anyone that we're not looking at the graph? Are we okay with it? <clears throat> so R of X equal X, what is the height equal to? Square root of X. So I think that it should be all we need. So volume is equal to two pi times the integral from zero to four of um, X times radical X DX. Yeah, how do we get R of X equals X? Why is that true? Right, so here's here's the region, right? 
<clears throat> upper curve is y equals radical x. <laughs> Lower curve is uh, y equals zero. If I'm using shell method, then I am taking these vertical rectangles, wrapping them around the y-axis. So how far or how far is any shell or any rectangle from the axis of rotation? Is that equal to simply the x value? Should be right. And the height should be equivalent to the y value. So radical x. So are we good on the integral that we have set up? <clears throat> How do we calculate it? What's the integral of x to the three halves? One more time. Two fifths. X to the five halves from four to zero. What is the, what is four to the five halves power? 32. So two pi times two fifths times 32 minus two fifths times zero. Four times 32 is 128. I think that's good. How would you? Any questions so far? Okay, so let's talk about this in general. So, how do we, what kind of things do we have to think about? Because now you have the disk method, disk slash washer method, and the shell method to find a volume. How do you make that determination? Like, what kind of things do you have to think about? So what variable are you going to integrate on? Sometimes that is going to be much more difficult used going one direction than the other. <clears throat> what else do you have to consider? Because one of them is, is purely algebraic, right? How do I, am I going to be, be able to integrate the thing that I set up based on the method I choose? But what else do you have to worry about? Well, right so you have to basically this method requires you to think about at least one radius um well, uh, shell method requires you to think about the radius and height every time well one thing that uh, i feel like it's i feel like you know this but i'm trying to coax it out of you um if I didn't dictate the shell method here, would we? Would you still try to use it? How come? So one thing we've talked about is like kind of the algebraic reason. Um, I think the integrals in terms of x, they're not even that much different from doing this in terms of y. Um, like when we graph it, you can kind of see the shape that it's going to be. Right. And decide then. What tells you what shape it's going to have? Well, in that one, it's like stuck to the x axis. Mm -hmm. So you can very clearly see like a height and a radius. Right. Like way more clear than when it's like two graphs. Like, and no. Yeah, okay. Here's the thing I'm getting at. I feel like you must know what I'm, I'm just trying to coax it out of you. How are we making that solid? It would look very different if I rotated over the x-axis, right? A very, very different volume. So I think the two big things to consider, to consider is the one you said a while ago, which is basically algebraic reasons. Which one of your integrals is going to be easier to deal with? Like I had a, I had a couple of cubics early on in this slideshow that probably couldn't have been isolated from the other variable. Um, but all, all that is still kind of governed by what the line looks like you're trying to rotate it over. If I asked you to do this by shell method and in terms of why, would that have worked?
that would be impossible because of the way you're rotating it. You're rotating it around a vertical line. So if you want to use X as the variable, you are using, you're stuck with the shell vector. So that's going to be one of the things that, um, you know, in the homework going forward, now that you've seen both methods, is you being able to make those choices. What else do I got for you? <coughs> so let's <coughs> figure out how we would do this. So let's do the y-axis first. We might not finish this, but we'll at least set up the integrals. If I want to revolve that curve around the y-axis, how would I find that volume? Shell method outcome. We want to keep, keep it in terms of x. If I could avoid completing the square, which is what that would require to uh, solve for y or solve for x, that'd be good. So x axis, we're going to do shell. <clears throat> so the volume of that is going to be 2, ti two pi times this integral from a to b. What variable am I looking at? Or what variable am I, in, am I integrating on? Should be x. Do I know what the radius and height are going to be? What's the radius going to be? Should be x, kind of for the same reasons that um, the previous one was. Radius x, what's the height? Negative x squared plus 6. Here we go. One thing we have to still figure out for our integral. What is that? The bounds. How do we get those? Set what equal to each other. Yeah. When we, yeah. So we have negative x squared plus 6x minus 8 equals 0, right? I'm going to multiply everything by negative one. Is this factor? So I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm going to go through it, but is that an integral you believe you could do? Should be possible. It's all going to be polynomials. What if instead did I give myself another slide for the x-axis? Yeah. <laughs> if I wanted to set this up and rotate around the x-axis, how would we do that? Disk method is it going to be disk or washer, or do we even do we even think they're different enough to make that distinction? Should be a disk. How come? Right. Basically, there is there's not going to be any space um, between our um, between our solid and the ro the line we're rotating around. So the volume is going to be. Pi times the integral from A to B of what? Y squared, so which Y? Okay. Do we know the bounds? Should still be two to four. So one thing to pay attention here is we use the variable X for both solids, right? So nothing is different about the area <clears throat> that you're working with. The only the, the difference is the, the way you're generating the solid based on that area. So if I'm using X for both situations, I should be able to use the same bounds. Not the same, not the same radius because we're revolving it differently, but we can use the bounds. Is that an integral you think you could do? You're going to get six terms. It's going to be a little bit messy, but I believe it can, it can be done. How are we doing? 
questions. Whoa. Do I want to do that last one? I think we've talked about volumes enough. Let's uh get into something else. So it's been the last 10 minutes or so here talking about arc lengths. So let's talk about how to set this thing up using an integral. So here I have a curve. <clears throat> I want to try to find not the volume, not the area, just how long. Like if I were to stretch that curve out straight and measure it, I want to find out how long that would be. So let's first talk about how I would make an approximation. How would I get a good estimate for how long that curve is? What? No, it stops at, it goes from zero to one. <clears throat> it does not mean the length of the curve is one though, right? If it was straight and horizontal, I believe it would be, but we got more to worry about. So is there a way we could make approximations for, for length somehow? If you would split it up into, I guess, it would be 10 different subsections, and then find like the difference between f of zero and f of point one, like, uh, okay, so you're talking about first splitting this up into 10 different chunks. And then what am I doing with those 10 points that I just cobbled together? Um, you would want to find the, the distance between them. So it would be. Uh, point one squared times whatever that difference is. Okay, so here's what we're doing. Basically, I don't know how to find the arc length on this thing, but I know that if I treat it like some straight lines, those straight lines are way easier to find distances of, right? So now that I have a method for approximating this curve with a bunch of straight line segments, how do I find the length of any one of those? So let's find the distance, the one that is like most obviously not a good approximation for its length. Let's look at the first interval. <clears throat> How do I find that distance along a straight line? Distance formula, How does, what is the distance formula look like? Yes, yeah, so it's essentially the, the Pythagorean theorem, right? So I'm gonna split each one of these up as this is a delta x, right? This is a delta y. The thing I'm trying to find is delta x squared plus delta y squared. Square root of that, right? So I'm calling it delta because I'm, we're, we're basically working up to an integral. So right now I have like these really long distances of separation. This is only gonna work for me if I can get these things really, really small, right? So I'm going to make these intervals smaller and smaller until I can look at this limit or this, yeah, to basically make these things infinitely, infinitesimally uh, thin. So now I can look at this idea, dx squared plus dy squared. So I'm going to do something else with this that maybe the reason won't be clear yet, but at least, uh, I at least want you to be convinced that it's legal. I'm gonna multiply the inside of this. <clears throat> um, by dx squared over dx squared. No, actually, that's not what I wanted to do. Oh, what the heck did I wanna do? I second guess myself. All right, so if I do this, then what do I get? I have the square root of dx squared over dx squared 
plus dy squared over dx squared all times dx squared, right? So first of all, is it legal that I've done that? I just basically have multiplied by one. I multiplied dx squared over dx squared. What is dx squared over dx squared? That's simply one, right? What can we say about dy squared over dx squared? First of all, can I, is it fair for me to say this? That is equal to dy dx all squared. And then the square root of dx squared, I'm just gonna say that's dx and move it to the outside. <clears throat> Does that dy dx stand out to anybody? What does that represent? What's that? Integral? dy dx, not an integral. It's the derivative. Basically that dy dx represents basically what the derivative of this curve is. So if we have an algebraic definition for that curve and I can take a derivative of it, then basically I can find the arc length by integrating, you know, all over my interval, this thing here. So just a reminder, the, the thing we built up there, that is to basically find the distance over one of these really small subintervals, one of these small dx subintervals, to find that arc length associated with that. So if I integrate over all of those, over a certain interval a, b, I can get the length of that curve. Basically, I could, if I knew what the derivative of this curve was, we could find that exactly. So any questions here on the setup, where that thing came from, before we do a couple? All right. So <clears throat> a couple things that, I mean, just to formalize it here, um, the way we did it just now, I've, I've found the derivative in terms of x, so dy dx. <clears throat> that whole manipulation, the whole calculation works out equivalently if you basically multiply dy squared over dy squared. So, you know, as opposed to volumes, you deciding which, basically you choosing x or y doesn't really alter a ton of the skeleton here. It's going to alter the functions you deal with and the derivatives you take. Um, the setups are very similar. Questions? All right, let's look at one. I want to find the arc length of this curve over that interval. So I don't have a great idea what this looks like, but we can. So from one to four, So basically, I'm trying to find the arc length between these two. So let's say this, first of all. Um, if I find the arc length, I know it has to be bigger than what? Like, what is a what is a minimum that I know I have to be bigger than? Just kind of as a, a mile post to check, our, to check ourselves when we're done. It has to be bigger than three, right? Um, so, I mean, if it was going straight horizontally across that interval, the length would be three. This is clearly not, if you believe my graph. <clears throat> All right, so based on what we just talked about, how do I find this arc length? So let's remind ourselves of this thing here. So the integral from A to B of radical one plus So let's set up this integral based on on that that template there. Essentially, what are the bounds? Should be one to four, right? Integrating the square root of one plus what? Three halves what? Three halves root x. Thank you. 
<clears throat> so we're getting there. Integral from four to one of one plus nine fourths x dx. Questions on how we got here. <clears throat> Is that an integral we can do? How should I approach it? How to get rid of the square root? Yeah, I think u substitution is a route. Um, not saying this. I'm not saying this is what the suggestion was, but when I hear get rid of the square root, I, I hear this thing. Is that true? That's not true at all. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, you can't break down the square root that way. Um, pick your favorite values of A and B, and it'll probably not work unless you get lucky and pick like zero and zero or something. But no, we can't. Not, again, I'm not saying that was the suggestion, but I've heard it suggested enough that I'm... Let's just put that out of, out of my... I heard you substitution. What should you be equal to? One plus nine over four X. All right. If we do that, then what else it has to follow? BU is equal to what? Nine over four DX. So now if I re-express this integral, I'll ignore the bounds for a second, but now what I have is the square root of u. What do I do with dx? Should be four over nine du, right? So already this integral, integral looks a lot more friendly to us. What are the bounds gonna be? They were one to four, I don't think they will be any longer. <clears throat> How do I find the new bounds? Plug it into what? What's that? Right. So this thing right here, this tells me two things. U equals one plus nine over four times one, which is 13 fourths. And U equals one plus nine over four times four, which is 10. So I believe this is our integral and we're just gonna get done. So the integral from four, 13 over four to 10, what is the integral of radical u? 2 thirds u to the three halves, just ignored something. Four over nine times 2 thirds u to the three halves from 13 over four to 10. It's 9.55, will it rob you of closure if I stop here? Or do you wanna see it done? You all seem pretty excited either way. Yeah, if y'all, okay, so let's finish it real quick. What is, um, I believe this all comes down to a third, right? A third times 10 to the 3 halves. Oh, you can't really even simplify this. A third times 10 to the 3 halves minus a third times 13 fourths to the 3 halves. Yeah, if you want to approximate that, you can, but I don't think any of that is going to come out particularly friendly. All right, I'll go ahead and stop there. Not a long weekend, is it? Is that next weekend? Yeah. All right. Have a good weekend. I'll see you all Monday.